Hello, I'm Pastor Angela Powell, Living Savior Lutheran Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I am delighted to welcome you all to this devotional time. I'm not going to be preaching on Acts 17, which is our reading, one of our readings on Sunday, May 17, but I did want to share something um, that I've learned about that with you so that, um, so that you might have some food for thought, if you will, during these days. It is, um, it's a, a good thing to, um, to know a little bit about the Acts of the Apostles. And so um, I'll be reading to you from the message version of Scripture, but I wanted to kind of set the stage for you, and my notes are coming from a study that I've done, and uh, some from Bishop Mike Reinhardt, and from several other resources. Um, Paul, who we um, haven't heard a whole lot about in our worship recently, um, we had last week where he was there uh, named Saul at the persecution and stoning of Stephen, and now he's in Athens, and we're kind of like, how did that happen? Well, God called Saul um, and uh, on the Damascus Road, and he had a powerful vision of Jesus. Jesus asked him about his persecution of the followers, and then um, um, Saul was uh, converted, if you will, and spent a number of years learning about Jesus and learning that he was called to care for the Gentiles. We catch up with Paul on his second missionary journey, and it is uh, assumed that about the year 50, 50 AD or 50 CE, common era, uh, Paul arrives in Athens. Now, Athens was considered the philosophical center of the universe, and here we know that um, in 387, Plato established a school right outside the city gates. We know that the city of Athens has the Parthenon and that the Acropolis of Athens, which Acropolis means the highest point in any city, had and still has the most amazing of, of uh, temples to the gods. So Paul has been traveling around. He has arrived in Athens. And he's waiting there for Silas and Timothy. And I want to read a little bit, too, from Scripture. The longer Paul waited in Athens for Silas and Timothy, the angrier he got. All those idols, a junkyard of idols, the message says that city was. And Paul discussed it with the Jews and other like-minded people at their meeting place. And every day he went out on the streets and talked with anybody who happened along. He got to know some of the Epicurean and Stoic intellectuals pretty well through these conversations. Because these intellectuals loved to have conversation in the marketplace. That was the way that they spent their time. That was their entertainment. They had uh, specific rules for how to do these conversations and things. And so some of them... Some of them dismissed Paul, and they dismissed what he was saying as, with sarcasm. Oh, what an airhead. But others listened to Paul go on about Jesus, about the resurrection, and they were intrigued. Because remember, this is a city that's full of idols. This is a city where there are many spiritual people, people who are searching for an understanding of multitudes of gods and perhaps even a single god and so they were intrigued by this jesus and they said that's a new slant on the gods this god jesus he's not like anything we've ever experienced so they wanted to know more so they asked paul to do a public presentation over at the Ar aragapis or excuse me arapagus which or Areopagus or Areopagus, um, and uh, we also know it as a place called Mars Hill. And it was an outcropping from the Acropolis, and it is very rocky. If you go there today, you can see a plaque that has Paul's speech on it. You can walk up there and you can see what it was like. It's quite amazing to walk in the footsteps of Paul in Athens to see some of the same sights that he saw. 
and to think that Christianity began in skepticism and spread like wildfire. So um, the reason they wanted to go up to the uh, Areopagus is because things were quieter there. In the marketplace, there was all kinds of gossip, all kinds of talking, all kinds of shopping. And yeah, they just didn't want to go there. And so they wanted to understand more fully. And, uh, and so instead of hanging with the tourists and hanging with the gossipers, they went to the place where you would give a public presentation. And so Paul laid it out for them. And I think that's the really important thing to think about. So as he's beginning to talk about um, this, there's a couple things that you need to know. Plato had the idea that virtue was its own reward and that righteousness was a human quality. Righteousness was something that could be learned. It could be, um, it could be um, enhanced, if you will. Um, it, it, was, it was something that you could practice and work at. And now Socrates said that righteousness is beneficial to rulers, and others said, well, maybe not so much. But Paul, teaching for Jesus, said that righteousness, you can't, humans cannot attain it. Righteousness is not obtainable by humans. It's a divine quality. And so, um, so there's a sense there that that's a big divide between Paul as a God-fearer, a Messiah worshiper, the follower of Jesus, and all these other people. Um, to reflect on the law is to contemplate the huge gulf be between human perception of what's good and our ability to obtain it. That's a lot of what Romans is about. No one can do good but by the grace of God. And the world has gone awry, if you will. Sin has come into the world, and the condemned and criminal and crucified righteous one, Jesus, became not only the Savior of Israel, but of the whole ruined creation, the whole cosmos. For God so loved the cosmos that he sent the Son, Jesus, to save. And so this tent maker, this Paul, this Pharisee above Pharisees is coming into this amazing city and he is trying to under lift up a crucified criminal as the savior of the world. Now you have to understand the savior of the world was the Roman emperor, Caesar. It said so in so many, the coins, the buildings, the temples, the power of Rome was everywhere. And so, um, so for Paul to walk in and say, no, no, this, this risen uh, Jesus who was crucified on the cross, yeah, that's, that's just so hard for people to imagine. So Paul walks in, and rather than taking issue with their idol worship, rather than coming in and bulldozing down their faith and belief, he says, you know, I see that you, this city is full of idols. And in fact, there's an altar to an unknown God. And, and I, I'm fascinated with all the shrines. And, and I see that you Athenians take your religion seriously, Paul says. And there's one, an unknown God, or as the message says, to the God nobody knows. Well, I'm here to tell you who that God is. So you can worship that God, the one who you're dealing with. The God who, this God, the unknown God, is the God who gives life. He doesn't live in a shrine. It is the one in whom we live and we move and we have our being. And your poets say we are the God, offspring of this God. And so Paul is using the philosophy of the time. He's using the, the God of the time, the shrines of the time, to make a case for his gospel. And he quotes them. 
And so what he does is he uses their symbols and their ideas, and he's trying to have a, a respectful dialogue. I think we Christians need that today. Paul's trying to build a bridge between where they are and where he is, and that bridge is Jesus. And so he goes on to say, um, I think it's almost a creed, if you will, and this is what Bishop Mike Reinhardt points out. If you look at the, at the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, and you read what, what Paul says, this creed is, we believe that God made the world and everything in it. We believe that God does not live in a temple made by human hands, that this church building that I'm in is not God's residence, that God is not served by humans. God doesn't need us to drop food off for him, that God doesn't need us to light candles. God does not need us to care for him. God gives less gives life and breath to everyone because God made the world and everything in it. God made every race from one person, Adam, Eve. God set the time and fixes the limits of humanity. We don't live in the ocean. We don't live in the heavens. We don't live in the ground. We live where God has placed us. And God is hidden from us so that, so that we search. And in fact, it says we grope in the NRSV. It says we might even grope for God. Have you ever lost your glasses and you've had to grope around or been in a very dark place? Maybe you've been camping and have no light or your flashlight fell and now you're groping around. And so when people ask and receive and seek and find, and the door will be opened. And so that's what this seeking for God is. God's not far away in some pantheon above us. God is with us not far removed. In fact, God is in us. We live and move and have our being in this God. And we are God's offsprings, made so by the waters of baptism. Even pagan poets can understand this kind of God, this God of our fathers, our ancestors. God's not made out of gold or silver. And let me tell you, in the Parthenon and in Athens, the gods there were amazingly beautiful, created with the richest of things. Not this God. This God comes to us with skin on, as a human flesh like us. And the one that God appointed to judge the world is Jesus, the righteous one, the one that is resurrected. And we are, it, it's just an amazing creed. And so I just invite you to read this text, to think about how Paul comes into this city a single voice, powered by the Holy Spirit, called to witness and to proclaim to the God that he knows. And he lays out a creed for us. And so if nothing else, I invite you to read this passage from Acts. It's, um, I, you can read the whole chapter of Acts if you want to get the whole feel for it. But it's actually the, the actual passage for this Sunday is Acts 17, 22 through 31. I love that saying. We live and move and have our being. This is not an unknown God. This is the God who holds us close especially in these days when we feel alone and isolated. Let's pray. Holy God, you are not unknown. You are known to us. And yes, there are people in our lives and people in our world who do not know you. And so we ask that it, by the power of your spirit, if we are called to proclaim who you are by your goodness to them, that you would give us the words to meet them where they are, that we would not crash and bulldoze and try to dismantle what they believe, but we would show them the beauty and power and amazing of who you are. 
we give you thanks that you are close to us as our own breath and that your spirit is with us always. You give us that spirit. You call it the paraclete. And that is the advocate, the comforter, the one who walks beside us, the one who helps us, the one who is with us, empowering us. And so as we come before you in humility, in worship, in praise, we give thanks to you. And we ask that you be with us. Show us your way. Guide us in your grace. Help us to live and move and be in you, in obedience and out of love, a deep and abiding love. And you said, if anything that you ask in my name, I will do. And so it is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for spending your time with me. Acts is an amazing book. Maybe one day you can travel to Athens and you can walk in the footsteps of Paul because it is a life-changing experience. God's peace, may the power and presence of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit keep you now and forever. Amen.